structural engineer, and one of the stories, I, I like true stories. One of the stories I like is that of Professor Michael Horn from the University of Manchester. And he was asked to go and look at a building that was in distress. Now, one of the things that happens when you go to look at a building that's got cracks or some kind of damage is that the client wants an instant judgment, just the same as when you go to your doctor and there's something wrong, you want an instant diagnosis. So Professor Horn was asked to go and look at this building, and it was an enormous great shed, like an aircraft hangar. And the client took him in and he looked up, and here was this horrible mess of rusting, twisted steelwork. Some of the members had rusted so much they'd fallen out, some of the bolts had fallen out, bits of the roof were sagging, and the client said, what do you think, Professor Horn? And Horn said, let's go outside and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and the moral of that story is that the best support is perhaps the briefest one. Now, uh, I'm starting a wee bit behind, but I'm going to try and make sure that I finish on time, and in a sense, the brief uh, answer to that one is, I think we do need to go back to the beginning. We've, we've, we've broken new ground with life-wide learning. So some people are further ahead than perhaps the, the, the majority of us here in this room. But I think we need to go back to the beginning and say, hey, uh, how would we start if we were starting from an empty sheet? So, uh, I think PDP is accommodated at the moment. It tends to be accommodated in the traditional context. And it seems to me that simply tinkering with the status quo to accommodate life-wide learning is, is, is maybe potentially unsound. Now, I was brought up over the past 15 or 20 years in a culture where we were taught that we should have alignment, that outcomes assessment and learning and teaching should all be talking to each other. And I've deliberately spelt out the learning in full and the teaching just with a T that these should all be speaking to each other and compatible. And, and all of that should be within, in England, FHEQ requirements, in Scotland, uh, SCQF. So there should be various standards at the different years of study and so on and so forth. And the features of ideal alignment then were, first of all, that we should have predetermined and intended learning outcomes. Now, intended learning outcomes really worry me because it, even in the, the status quo, some of my students will tell me about outcomes which are not covered by the module list. Unintended learning outcomes, and I think that's great. And when I quote examples of these, and I won't do that this morning, about 40% of the people in the group will nod their heads and they haven't gone to sleep. It's because they've encountered examples of rich, unintended learning outcomes. But the culture says that we're uh, heading towards intended learning outcomes. So the assessment demands have got to be compatible with the outcomes. I had a terrible job when I tried to persuade the University of the Highlands and Islands, which we're now allowed to call that, when I tried to persuade them that maybe the last outcome for some of my modules should be, and any other outcome not listed above, <laughs> which, which is compatible with the aims of this course. And, and that's where the richest learning was claimed. Okay, assessment has got to be compatible with the outcomes. We're supposed to plan the learning to achieve the outcomes. And I suggest to you as an external examiner and a former QAA auditor, we're not always as good as that at that as we might be. Um, achieving competence is central in the planning. We want to have reasonably successful students. We, we think of ourselves as providing more and more facilitative support rather than instruction. Uh, we should be choosing assessment methods which are appropriate and the assessment should confirm the intended development. I notice in all of this, the program names and the criteria are predetermined. And I've chosen that list deliberately because I now want to use an example uh, and test my example against that list. In Napier, uh, they, we have a rather curious arrangement in parallel with the MSc in Human Relations Management. And that is that students prepare themselves for associateship of CIPD. And what happens is that a personal tutor facilitates the students are going to be self-directed, self-managed, and at least in part, they will be self-assessed. And what they do is they choose six objectives. 
It was freely chosen by the learner, but there's a bit of a constraint. You mustn't choose something that might be part of your course. It can be associated with your course, but not. So you can choose two, which are, if you like, to do with the academic activity you're involved in at the moment. You have to choose two which are to do with your employment or your potential employment, and two which are to do with you. These are developments that I would like to happen in me. So you choose six objectives, you spell these objectives out in smart terms, specific, measurable, attainable, uh, reasonable, and uh, time, uh, well the resources are reasonable, and the time is going to be appropriate. So you spell out your objectives and start thinking about your plan. You're in a learning community, and in that learning community, we arrange for you to have peer support for your learning community as you commission. We don't arrange it, we simply say that's our expectation that you'll use the peers in your learning community. And what you do is you assemble data. Our students weren't awful good at assembling portfolios. They kept forgetting to do it and trying to build up the portfolio at the end of the day. And then one day I said to my students, look, get a shoebox. And put a shoebox in the corner of your room. And whenever there's a scrap of paper from a phone call or from an email or from a workshop, which might be evidence relating to your development, chuck it in the shoebox and number the shoebox items from the bottom up. And then when you come to present their claims, thumb through the shoebox and say, oh, hey, wait, I forgot that. Or there's a piece of evidence that I can use. So the students assemble data to support their claims. Um, they, they facilitate each other in the learning communities in terms of claims which are perhaps not very well substantiated. And then they present their claims not so much for a second assessment by the tutor and by the system as for audit. The system says, okay, did you do what you set out to do? Did you do it rigorously and effectively? So which features apply there? The student, I'm going to put ticks against them now. The students have predetermined their intended learning outcomes, their objectives. The assessment demands if, if, it's, if these are smart goals, they have to be compatible with the outcomes. They plan their learning and development to achieve their outcomes. Achieving competence normally is central in their planning, although sometimes they have affective goals. They want to develop confidence rather than competence, and they begin to come to see that. We arrange facilitative support. You have peers in the learning community who collaborate in all sorts of ways, and this way. I'm not sure the assessment methods are appropriate. I think sometimes my conventional colleagues in the assessment boards uh, would raise their eyebrows if they actually knew what was happening. But you know, what happens behind closed doors between consenting adults is our business. Um, the, the assessment certainly should confirm the intended development. La last night I was working, for instance, facilitating a reflective learning diary in which one woman student was trying to uh, reflect on the way she is handling her time management and her prioritizing. I didn't teach her one of you, I, I was just facilitating. And at the end of the day, well, she's near the end of the day, that assessment is going to confirm the progress that she's made through her reflective evidence. But the program aims and the criteria have been predetermined. Now, what I'd like you to do is, each person, think of a PDP-related module that you know about. Think about one now. Just choose one in your head. Look. Okay. Check quickly and then tell a neighbor, do these characteristics that I have outlined, do they apply in your example of a PDP? Has it been shoehorned in to fit the patterns of academia? There's my list. Four minutes. trying too hard with life-wide learning. We were trying to fit a square life-wide learning peg into our own traditional hole. Now let me just test out that assumption at the moment. And I'm trying to take us back to concentrate on life-wide learning from scratch. 
Surely we should be leading learners in new directions. Surely these directions shouldn't necessarily entail premeditation. Some of the most important things I've learned, things that I remember again and again and quote as Norman's wee stories or whatever, th these are things which just happened to come along in the midst of a worthwhile experience. I wasn't planning for them at all. Uh, and, and surely in lifeway learning, we want to stress considerable learner choice in almost everything. I'm going to take a lifeway learning example now which is taken from a traditional model module into which it has been shoehorned. So this is an undergraduate module for people who are having difficulty putting their courses together. It's about developing employability. And you can come on this module if you have any part-time employment, provided you've got some support from your employer. You could be stacking shelves and waitresses or whatever it is. And the first thing you've got to do in part of the module is to identify one critical incident a week. And you reflect on what you can learn from it. And then you consider how you may apply that in the future. You don't just say, I've learned this. OK, what difference is it going to make to me? How do I, can I apply that in the future, next week and the week after that? And that reflection is facilitated if you want it to be facilitated. And then what about the assessment? Well, at the end of the module, we say to you, and I quite like this approach, we ask you, what are your three best examples of reflection? And then there's a PS question that comes in there. And why do you value them? And, and the, what really comes out in, in the dialogue there is, and why do I value it? Not my three best examples, but why do I value them? And, and the follow-up. And then it may be that what you would be, do with your employer's support would be to see a plan for enhancement of a work activity. For instance, we had one student who went to work in a, a health centre and, and began employment at Christmas when all sorts of people poured in, people the same shape as me, who decided that they wanted to be thinner and more fit. And one of the problems was that registering them and getting all the documentation was a lengthy process and it frustrated them. They wanted to go straight in and get onto the machines and do something, you know? And, and so this guy conceived a plan in which they could be registered and the process could be marching on while they were in the center and then they could come out at the end of the first session and complete it. And the employer was so impressed that they changed their procedures. So you can conceive a plan for the enhancement of the work activity and implement it with the employer's approval and, and make a report to them. Now this module, it was only one semester long. Something like a third of the students had a pay rise while they were on the module. And something like 20% of the students were moved up a job category during the module. That wasn't bad. It did suggest that maybe we developed employability to some extent. These features, most of the outcomes were unintended ones. The student in the health center developed the ability to persuade his employers to consider something which sounded like cheek coming from a new employee. The activity wasn't chosen to facilitate particular development. He, he chose his uh, employment so that he could make some money over the Christmas New Year season. The, the assessment was reflective and analytical. What have I learned? What can I do with it? How, how do I value it and why? The outcomes and criteria are often intensely personal. Often they're tied up with, I've developed much more confidence. For instance, examining some of Norman's students on his Lifeway Learning Award a few months ago, what impressed me most of all was that they were telling a story about someone who had changed and had become more confident without being brash. So they're intensely personal. Learners will evolve their own frameworks for judging, judging themselves. The outcomes are identified through review and evaluation. And so self-knowledge features prominently. The, the student last night who was talking about prioritizing and managing her time, it was a very personal record. And probably something, she sent it to me and said, John, would you mind commenting on this? Probably because she didn't want to share it with a fellow student. And development of confidence of said of the future strongly. Many of the outcomes are very difficult to substantiate and, and to some extent uh, an assessor would only go